it's actually about my brother, um, Ping, and a lot of older siblings will be able to identify with me um, with the guilt that you feel in terms of the way you treated your siblings, younger siblings when you were younger. Um, and my relationship with my brother, it was, I was one night and I was going to church and stuff and, you know, and I was praying and stuff like that. And then I went back home and I really, I was praying for some reason, um, probably I was praying because of the message I just heard and so on, right? And God, and all of a sudden, you know, God showed me these five images of me and my brother and it was very real and I was crying and, and he showed me these five images. The first image was... Um, of my brother, when we were really young, he was a real innocent kid, and this image was just of his innocence, right? And I was leaning from side to side on this chair, and and he was so innocent, and I was only playing around, but he was so innocent that he didn't want me to fall, you know, so he's trying to catch me on this side, trying to catch me on that side, right? And so that just flicked through my eyes. And the next four images were of the damage that I had done to him, so we won't elaborate into that stuff. <laughs> but... Um, through many things that I did to him, I caused him a lot of grief. I, grief. I broke his self-esteem. I derided him with words. You know, there's a lot of power in words. And, you know, you tell someone they're stupid, they're blah, blah, blah. It does a lot of damage, you know. And there's this Chinese proverb. And it says, you give me a kid that is age seven, and I'll show you the man who will become. Meaning that the formative years of an individual are mostly created in um, the early stages of their life. And for me, that's absolutely devastating because my brother was older than seven by then. And, and it just devastated me because I knew I had done something. You know, he was a very closed kid. You know, he is this one time we were all talking with, about him downstairs. And he, he tells us now that he was upstairs listening and he could hear that they were, we were all talking about him and how to fix him and all this kind of stuff. It was really, really heartbreaking what he went through. And um, so it really broke my heart because I knew there was nothing I could do to heal my brother. There's, you know, I had done this damage that I could not rectify. And I was really broken by that, you know. And I really prayed to God and I was like, Lord, I am so sorry for what I did, you know. And, and so, and I was, you know, writing down all this stuff and I was like, okay, that's it. You know, I'm going to go to Penn. And we had the opportunity. We went to Australia and we met up in Australia. And me and my sister and he, him sat down and... I prayed to him, I, I, mean, I, I sat down with him and I just said, Ping, I'm really sorry for all the things I've done to you in the past. And he knows, you know, all of them. And I said, I'm so sorry. And, you know, there is nothing I can do to rectify it. And I just want to ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive me for the damage that I've done. And so he, um, he, he forgave me. And, and, we were, and, and we prayed about it, you know, and prayed for healing upon him. And my brother never cries. You know, he never cried. You know, he was always bottled up, and whenever we'd say stuff to him, he'd get angry and angry on the inside, just completely destroyed on the inside. And he, um, and he started crying and crying. God's presence was really there, you know, really touched, you know. And I can safely, uh, I can say now, you know, it, it could have happened without me, right? But I'm so happy that God used me to be a blessing to my brother, to be able to, you know, make him into the man he is now. He's very mature. He's, he's very wise in many ways, more mature than I am. And, and it, it's been a real privilege to see him who he is now. And that was, that was the power of God working through my life, you know, in a very real way, through God speaking to me, me taking that word and applying it. And now I can say he's the man he is today. And I've been privileged to be part of that journey. And, you know, in Jeremiah 29, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. For many of you tonight, that might be for you. You know, know that the way he's touched my life, he can move through your life and really bless not only yourself, but for other people. It says Jesus came, in the Bible it says Jesus came to give life and life in all its fullness. This is the kind of fullness we're talking about. You know, so we're talking about the second proposition, church. Um, if you're connected to church, are you connected with your destiny? And here, when I talk about church, I'm not talking about Elam. I'm talking about the body of Christians, being in a body of Christians, right? Um, and being taught and stuff like that. So 
I'd say, um, to answer this question, I think we need to understand where the church is coming from. And so with, I want to read to you this quote that I read about a pastor's heart. Um, and I think it very much applies to our pastors here, Mike and Rob and um, Fiona and Jeannie and so on. A pastor's heart cry is for every single one of his sheep to become all that they can be. Every week he or she gives to them from the deep well from his heart truth from God's words so that they can grow and live abundant lives. He or she prays diligently for them. He or she thinks about them 24-7 and about how he can improve the outreaches so that more people can be touched by the love of Christ. And you know, I mean, like every pastoral team, like every team, we've all got issues, right? But I can tell you, this pastoral team, their heart is for you. And essentially, that is what church is about. We have church so that we can really build the people so that they can be all that they can be. You know, and we bring in outside people who haven't heard the message of grace, and we bring them in. You know, and I can say confidently that this pastoral team does that. You know, tries its best to do that for you guys. So that's, that's where you know, that's where church is coming from. That's their heart, that's the pastoral heart for you people and the people out there. Um, and I see it like it's a moral and spiritual training ground. We come back, you know. It's like base camp. Um, you're out there waging your war, doing your thing, and fighting the best way you know how. You come back to camp, um, you sharpen your weapons, you get, you get more training, you recuperate. You know, some of you come for the feeds, <laughs> some of you come for the sleeps. <laughs> but, you know, we all come back and we train up, ready to go back out. And every time we come back, we're improved in some way. You know, we apply the teaching that we've got, we apply it to our lives and go out. And um, in Psalm chapter 133, verse 1, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Like, was, like what Nathan was talking about tonight, unity when you can share, when you confess to other your sins so that they don't hold you back in the future. When you um, build each other, equip each other, iron sharpens iron, you know, you can, be in that, you can be in that zone with those people to encourage you to go out and fight the fight. 